These are the types of questions that you will see about these things because you can make some logical leaps of faith uh, once you know a little bit about how this is going on. This says, write the orbital box notations of the valence electrons for silicon and fluorine. All right, let's try to start with silicon. Silicon, if we go with this guy here, is going to be neon and it's going to be 3s2, 3p2. So that's from our lesson before. Neon, and then 3s2 and 3p2. What is the valence boxes for those guys? Well, let's take a look. It's s's and p's. So s's have one box, p's have three box, because s's have two electrons in them. So we need one box for them. And there it is. There's your s box. And P's, remember, have six electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six. So you need three boxes to go with them. So if it's S2, P2, then it's gonna be S2 up and down, and then P2 up and up. So that's what silicon looks like. Uh, fluorine. Fluorine is here. So fluorine has the electron notation of helium and it's going to be 2s2 2p5 so there's helium and then s2 and then p5 because there are five of them there so if we go to draw the boxes for those guys s and p we have s2 so first thing we're going to do is put one up and then one down because that's how it works and then P, we need five. So we'll go one, two, three, and then four, and then five. So that's the valence box notation for this one. Next up, it says examine the chart of the ionization energies below. Why are the ionization energies of oxygen and sulfur lower than would be expected? We'll take a look. If you start here, for example, with the lithium, row this guy here generally speaking these numbers are going up and up and up and up and up but check it out oxygen actually goes down a little bit with its ionization energy compared to where you would think it would go with the numbers going up and up and up and up and up you would think that the oxygen would be higher than the nitrogen but it's not well why, why would that be well let's draw the electron notation for it here is oxygen and oxygen has the notation of helium and then it's going to be 2s2 2p4 so here is helium and then it's going to be s2 and p4 so that is the notation for oxygen so if we go to put those into the boxes we get s2 and now p4 1 2 3 4 now, if we go to take an electron from oxygen, look what happens. If we take an electron, we're probably going to take that guy and make him go away. And if we do that, now what do we have? We have three half-filled orbitals all spinning the same direction. Gee, what does that sound like? Half-filled orbitals spinning the same direction is the very definition of Hund's rule. Hund's rule says the most stable arrangement of electrons in a subshell is when degenerate or duplicate orbitals are half filled spinning the same direction or when they are totally filled. So consequently, by getting rid of that one electron, because remember, here's where we were. This is where oxygen starts. But by getting rid of that one electron, we now actually satisfy Hund's rule. So oxygen is a little bit easier than you would think it would be for that first electron to be removed. Sulfur, it's an identical situation. It's just one level down. So here is sulfur. Sulfur is going to be neon. And it's going to be 3s2, 3p4. So again, 3s2 and 3p4 there. So if we go and put in our s2p4, we get this. There's s2, p1, 2, 3, and 4. 
And again, ionization energy is the taking of an electron. So if we go to take an electron away, and we take that first one away, in doing so, now we have three degenerate orbitals that are all half-filled spinning the same direction. So it's actually a little easier than you would think to remove that first electron from sulfur, because when you do, Hund's rule becomes satisfied. <clears throat> Next up, it says, what ionic charges are most likely for the following metals? All right, well, let's check these guys out. Let's see, potassium. We need to find potassium. Here it is. Potassium has the notation of uh, argon, and then it's just one past the argon. So potassium has the notation of argon, and it's 4s1. So all we have to do for these guys, again, these are your S's, your P, I'm sorry, your D's, and your P's that are here. Here's potassium that looks like this. Well, look, what charge is potassium going to go to? If we go and just take this electron away, out it goes. Now it becomes potassium with a plus one, and it looks like this. So here is potassium. There is potassium plus one. Plus one is the obvious charge for that. What about calcium? Well, calcium is right next to potassium over here. So instead of it being 4s1, it's going to be 4s2. Okay, let's see. So this is going to be argon 4s2. So there is calcium. Well, what charge is calcium going to go to? Well, look, there's only two electrons there, so you've got to lose those two electrons. But Smith, <clears throat> your Hun's rule said that when it's totally filled, it becomes stable. Mm, slight exception to this, it's when degenerate orbitals are half-filled, spinning the same direction, or totally filled. In the S subshell, they're loners. So S's are never stable because they're never degenerate. So S's don't obey Hun's rule. So if we're going to go and we're going to make an ion out of this, all we have to do is remove those two because the S's are never, ever stable because they are never degenerate. So S orbitals are almost always ionized because they don't obey Hun's rule because they are not degenerate. They are loners. They are all by themselves. All right, now let's do something a little bit more challenging. Let's try manganese here. What's manganese going to look like? Well, manganese is here. Here is manganese, so that is going to start here with argon. So the notation for manganese is going to be argon, and then our next ones here are going to be 4s2, but then we're going to go here, and remember it's a d, so it's a little bit less, so that's going to be 3d5. Remember, it's always one less than it should be. So <clears throat> manganese is argon, 4s2, 3d5. So let's go ahead and put those into the boxes that are there. So there's manganese, argon, 4s2, 3d5. 4s2 looks like this, and 3d5 looks like this, like so. All right, well, if we're going to go make an ion out of this, which electrons do you think we're going to lose, and what charges do you think we're going to get? Well, we already said that the S's are never stable because of Hun's rule, and they are always removed. So the S's can go, for sure. We'll get rid of those guys. But what about any of these guys here? Should I remove any of these five? Well, what does Hun's rule say? You get extra super stability when degenerate, identical orbitals are half-filled, spinning the same direction, or when they are totally filled. These are all half-filled, spinning the same direction. So because of this, this has actually gained an extra degree of stability. This is a little bit more stable than you would expect it to be. So how many of these are lost then? Probably none. So consequently, manganese is probably only going to go to a plus two charge because you're going to lose those two 
but then you will keep these five, one, two, three, four, and five. So the notation for manganese plus two is now going to be argon 3D5 because you're going to lose the four S's, but you're not going to mess with any of the three D's that are there. So manganese quite often goes to a plus two charge. Well, what about iron? Let's find iron. So here's iron. Right next to manganese. So it's going to be the same thing with one more electron. So here is iron. It's going to be argon. And it's going to be 4s2, 3d6. There's your 4s2. And then here's your 3d6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So iron is argon, 4s2, 3d6. So let's throw that down here. And let's go ahead then and put in the electrons. 4s2, 1 and 2, and 3d6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and now 6. So, what charge do you think iron is most likely going to like to go to? Well, based upon the same idea as before, Remember that the S's are never degenerate, so the S's are never stable, so those two are probably going to go for sure. You're probably going to lose the 4S. But then now, what about these guys over here? Should any of them go? Well, can we make Hun's rule happy? Can we get them all half-filled, spinning the same direction, or can we get them all totally filled? Well, we can if we lose that one electron and we make him go away. See ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. And if we do that and we lose that one electron, then what we are left with is this here, which is now argon 3d5. Oh, by the way, doesn't that look familiar? Argon 3d5 was the same answer that this guy went to. Except that in order to get to that notation, the iron had to lose one, two, three electrons to do it. So the iron likes to go to a plus three charge rather than a plus two charge. So the most common oxidation state or charge for iron is typically the plus three charge. So here is normal iron. Here are iron atoms. And then below are iron ions. So that's how iron shows up, but this is how iron wants to be in order to be stable. One more example here, cadmium. What is cadmium look like? Let's see, here's cadmium. Erase all this, let's find cadmium. There he is, there's cadmium. So cadmium here is gonna start at krypton and then work its way across. So cadmium looks like it's going to be Krypton. And now we're going to be here, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's 5s2. And then apparently it's all the way over in the D subshell. So that's going to be 4d10. So cadmium is Krypton, 5s2, 4d10. Let's go ahead and put those in. So, oopsie. Cadmium is Krypton, 5s2, 4d10. Let's go ahead and put them in. 5s2, here and then there. 4d10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. All right, well, now we're going to go and we're going to ionize some things. So what charges is cadmium going to like to go to? Well, once again, those S's are never stable, they're never degenerate, so they're always going to go away. But what about these guys over here? Those guys over here, well, that looks like Hun's rule. They're all completely filled. And remember, Hun's rule says you get extra bonus stability when you're half filled, spinning the same direction, or when you're totally filled. 
that is totally filled. So consequently, how many of those electrons are going to leave the D subshell? Probably none. We're going to keep all 10 of them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And so the notation for cadmium is just going to be krypton 4D10. And cadmium likes to go to a plus 2 charge because it's going to lose the 2 from the S's that are here and leave all of the ones that are in the D subshell. So, what started off as a simple observation of magnetism has developed into the point that we can now begin to be predictify what some of the charges are going to be for some of even the goofier ones that we have seen in this middle transition.